VOA 1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from John Russell, Dan Friedel, and Jill Robbins. Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. And Kelly Jean Kelly tells us about the presidency of Harry Truman. But first, here is John Russell. Scientists used the ancient remains of bones and teeth to recreate a big shark that lived in the oceans millions of years ago. The creature was so huge, a recent study estimated it could have eaten something the size of a killer whale in just five bites. For the recently published study, researchers used fossil evidence to create a three-dimensional, 3D, model of the megalodon, one of the biggest fish of all time. The study was published in Science Advances. It said megalodon was around 16 meters from nose to tail, bigger than a school bus. It is also several times the size of today's great white shark. Megalodon's large mouth meant it could feed on big creatures. Once it filled its stomach, it could travel the oceans for months at a time, the researchers suggested. The megalodon was a strong swimmer, too. Its average swimming speed was faster than sharks today, and it could have traveled across several oceans with ease, scientists said. John Hutchinson, a co-writer of the study, described the megalodon as a super-predator. He added, There is nothing really matching it. It has been difficult for scientists to get a clear picture of the megalodon, said study co-writer Catalina Pimiento. The skeleton is made of soft cartilage that does not become a fossil very often, Pimiento said. So the scientists used the few fossils that are available, including a rare collection of backbones that has been at a museum in Belgium since the 1860s. Researchers also brought in many megalodon teeth, each as big as a closed human hand, Hutchinson said. Special images of modern great white sharks helped researchers recreate the rest of the creature. Researchers estimate that the megalodon would have weighed around 70 tons, or as much as 10 elephants. Even other high-level hunters may have been food for the megalodon, which had a mouth almost two meters wide, Pimiento said. Megalodons lived an estimated 23 million to 2.6 million years ago. Since megalodon fossils are rare, these kinds of models require a leap of imagination, said Michael Gottfried, who studies ancient bones at Michigan State University. Gottfried was not involved in the study, but he said the study's findings are reasonable based on what is known about the large shark. I'm John Russell. American muscle cars got their name because of their big, powerful engines and fast speed. Some of the gas-powered cars are so noisy, the Associated Press recently described them as thundering. But interest worldwide in electric cars brings up this question. Can a muscle car go electric? 
the car maker Stellantis makes the Dodge Challenger and Charger, two well-known muscle cars. General Motors makes the popular Chevrolet Corvette. Both companies are wondering if they can keep the interest of buyers who love traditional gas-powered cars. Car fans who loved the classic, powerful cars that used a lot of fuel are called gearheads. The new battery-powered cars are quicker than the old gas-powered cars that sold themselves based on horsepower. Horsepower is a term used to talk about the power created by an engine. For years, high horsepower signaled high performance. While the new cars go fast and are easier to control than cars with big engines, they do not make much noise. Will the gearheads someday become battery heads? Stellantis hopes so. The company, which is half American and half Italian, will stop making gas-powered versions of the Challenger, Charger, and its larger Chrysler 300 by the end of 2023. Other automakers are in the process of doing the same thing. Many European automakers already have electric versions of their high-performance cars. They include Porsche, Audi, and Mercedes. General Motors said it will soon make an electric Corvette. Polestar is an electric vehicle company started by the owners of Volvo. Polestar says a Roadster, or small, fun car, is coming soon. Governments around the world are requiring cars to create less pollution. U.S. President Joe Biden's administration also recently put in place new rules. As a result, car makers are starting to center their production on electric cars. Some car factories are being updated so they can make electric vehicles. Other producers are building new factories. Tim Kuniskis leads the Dodge division for Stellantis. It's tough, he said, when discussing the idea that governments are considering financial punishments, known as fines, for companies that do not meet new requirements to reduce fuel use. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, said Stellantis's cars use the most fuel and have the worst effect on the environment. Some of the cars, such as one version of the Charger with a big engine called the Hemi Hellcat, travel only about five kilometers on a liter of fuel. New rules put in place by the EPA say all of a company's new car models must be much more fuel efficient by 2026 than they are now. Sam Abuel Samid is a researcher for Guidehouse Insights. He said some car makers will keep making models with traditional engines known as internal combustion engines, for about 10 years. Dodge is working to improve its car's use of fuel, but also keep the gearheads interested. The new cars will make noise like the old ones, even if they are using batteries. A recent demonstration by Dodge showed off a charger that made noise just like a muscle car. Kuniskis, however, is a critic of his own company's new car. It doesn't have the emotion, he said, speaking of the electric cars. It doesn't have the drama. It doesn't have the dangerous feeling of an internal combustion engine. But he did say that the new electric charger would be the fastest ever. I'm Jill Robbins. I'm Dan Friedel. The American Space Agency, NASA, 
is making final preparations to launch a new rocket designed to return humans to the moon. NASA has described its Space Launch System, or SLS, as the most powerful rocket ever built. The 98-meter rocket arrived Wednesday at a launch complex at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It took nearly 10 hours for the rocket to make the six-and-a-half-kilometer trip to the launch center. NASA is calling the first launch of the SLS rocket Artemis-1. There will be no crew on the spacecraft during the first mission. SLS will carry NASA's Orion spacecraft on a test mission to fly around the moon. SLS is the first rocket designed to carry both astronauts and supplies on a single mission. It is part of NASA's Artemis program, which aims to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon. Artemis has a goal to land American astronauts on the moon no earlier than 2025. It would be the first moon landing by astronauts since NASA's Apollo 17 mission in 1972. Currently, NASA is planning for an August 29th liftoff. Three mannequins will be placed inside the crew capsule at the top of the rocket. They will be connected to a series of sensors designed to measure radiation and movements during the mission. During the test mission, Orion will aim to travel 450,600 kilometers from Earth and thousands of kilometers beyond the moon. NASA said this will be farther than any spacecraft built for humans has ever traveled. The mission is expected to last four to six weeks. The main purpose of the SLS mission is to test the system for a future flight, including astronauts. But the rocket will also be carrying a series of payloads to support science experiments. Among the payloads will be a CubeSat designed to look for water on the moon's surface. CubeSats are small research spacecraft, also known as nanosatellites. They provide a low-cost way for scientists, governments, and private organizations to carry out space experiments. NASA calls the CubeSat aboard the SLS Lunar Ice Cube. It is about the size of a shoebox and weighs 14 kilograms. While orbiting the moon, Lunar Ice Cube will use an instrument called a spectrometer to look for and examine lunar ice. A spectrometer is an instrument used to measure atomic and molecular reactions. NASA has said the search for ice on the moon is important because water is a necessary resource for future exploration activities. Astronauts could use the ice for drinking water and to cool equipment or make rocket fuel for missions deeper into the solar system. The space agency said in a recent statement that Lunar Ice Cube will be seeking data on the absorption and release of water from the regolith, the moon's rocky and dusty surface. With Lunar Ice Cube investigating this process, NASA can map these changes as they occur on the moon, the statement said. The CubeSat will also study the exosphere. The exosphere is the thin outer area around a planet or satellite object, such as the moon. 
NASA says data collected by Lunar Ice Cube will give scientists a better understanding of how water and other substances behave on the moon. With this information, researchers hope to be able to predict seasonal changes affecting lunar ice that could affect its use as a resource. I'm Brian Lynn. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Harry S. Truman. He became President of the United States in 1945, a few weeks before the end of World War II in Europe. Truman took office after Franklin Roosevelt died suddenly of a cerebral hemorrhage. Roosevelt had been president for 12 years, but Truman was new to the position of vice president. Two other men had earlier served in the office under Roosevelt. On April 12, 1945, less than three months after he became vice president, Truman was called to the White House. There, Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor, told Truman about her husband's death. Truman was quickly sworn in as president. Shortly after the ceremony, the Secretary of War privately told Truman about a secret project involving American scientists. They were building an extremely destructive atomic bomb. Historians debate whether Truman already knew about the project or whether the information was a complete surprise. In either case, the new president had to decide whether to use the weapon, which he called the most terrible bomb in the history of the world. Harry Truman came from simple beginnings. He was born in the state of Missouri. He, his parents, a brother and a sister, lived in the town of Independence. As a boy, Harry Truman helped his father on the family's farm, but he did not enjoy the work. And he could not play sports because he could not see very well. From the time he was a child, Truman wore eyeglasses. So he developed his interests in reading and music. He was an especially good piano player. Truman was also a good student, but his parents did not have enough money to send him to a four-year college. Instead, Truman worked in a number of jobs, including as a bank clerk, mining company operator, and partner in an oil business. When the United States became involved in World War I, Truman decided to rejoin the National Guard. His guard unit became part of the U.S. Army, and Truman earned a position as a captain. Truman experienced real success in the military. He was an able soldier and leader, and he and his troops fought in battle. When the war ended, Truman kept both the feeling of self-confidence and the friendships with the other soldiers he had formed. One of Truman's first acts after the war was to get married. He married a woman from his hometown. They had been romantically linked for a long time. Her name was Elizabeth Wallace, but she was called Bess. The Trumans remained happily married for more than 50 years and had a daughter named Mary Margaret. In the first years after the war, Harry Truman opened a men's clothing shop with a friend from the military. But the shop, called a haberdashery, eventually failed. Truman soon found a new line of work, an operative from the Democratic Party asked Truman to be a candidate for a position as a judge. Truman won the seat, 
as well as a public reputation for being an honest, effective public servant. In time, Truman successfully won election to a seat in the U.S. Senate. For the most part, he earned a good public image there, too. He supported the social programs of President Roosevelt, and he tried to prevent big businesses or large labor unions from misusing public money. Both voters and Democratic officials liked Truman enough to accept him as the party's vice presidential candidate in 1944. Truman performed well as a candidate, but he did not have a close relationship with Roosevelt or play much of a part in his government. Yet in a few weeks following Roosevelt's death, Truman was leading the country. Truman faced a number of difficult decisions during his two terms as president. Many of them involved foreign policy. His actions helped shape the second half of the 20th century. In his first months after taking office, Truman watched the end of World War II in Europe. He then had to decide how to deal with the war in the Pacific. Japan did not want to accept the Allied forces' demand for total surrender, and Truman did not want to extend the war. So he approved using the atomic bomb on Japan. Truman directed the Secretary of War to drop the weapon on military targets and try to reduce civilian deaths. But the destruction was still terrible. An estimated 192,000 people died in the attack or the effects of the bomb in Hiroshima. Most of the city was destroyed. Three days later, the U.S. military dropped another atomic bomb, this time on the city of Nagasaki. More than 70,000 people died instantly. The Emperor of Japan called the weapon a new and most cruel bomb. He agreed to his country's surrender on August 14, 1945. World War II came to an end. Truman and his government quickly had to make other decisions about how to react to the new international situation. One of the most pressing concerns was the Soviet Union, Soviet officials sought to expand their influence around the country's borders, especially in Eastern Europe, Turkey, and Iran. Truman and other U.S. officials believed those moves threatened American interests. The United States supported democracy and capitalism. It did not want the Soviet Union's form of communism to spread. So Truman's government put in place two measures to answer the Soviet Union's influence. One was a policy known as the Truman Doctrine. It promised American support to Greece, Turkey, and other democratic nations against authoritarian forces. The measure was a new step for the United States. In the past, the country had tried to avoid conflicts that did not directly involve it. Under Truman, the U.S. government was committed to helping free peoples anywhere by improving their living conditions. A second measure came to be called the Marshall Plan, after Truman's Secretary of State, George Marshall. Marshall wanted the United States to invest a large amount of money in rebuilding Europe after World War II. Because the Soviet Union controlled much of Eastern Europe, 
The money eventually went to improving the market economy of Western Europe. The Office of the Historian at the State Department notes that one effect of the Marshall Plan was to introduce foreign aid programs as an official part of U.S. foreign policy. Truman also sought to guarantee peace and contain communism in other ways. He supported the United Nations, which was officially launched during his presidency and he negotiated a military alliance among Western democratic nations. The group became known as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Military alliances became especially important in 1950, when communist forces in North Korea invaded South Korea. The UN agreed to send troops to help South Korea although many of the troops were American, and they were led by an American general. Fighting in the Korean War lasted until 1953. As many as five million people died in the conflict. Neither side gained much territory. But the Korean War had other effects. It fueled the Cold War between communist and democratic forces, it showed the U.S. would really defend other countries against authoritarian forces. It sharply increased American spending on the defense industry. And it helped make President Truman very unpopular. Many Americans believed Truman was losing the battle against communism. During his presidency, the Soviet Union successfully tested a nuclear weapon and China officially became a communist country under Mao Zedong. Some U.S. lawmakers even accused Truman's government of protecting communist spies. Senator Joseph McCarthy was the most famous of these critics. He launched investigations against thousands of U.S. government employees, as well as movie actors and directors in Hollywood. McCarthy did not have evidence that these people were secretly working for the Soviet Union, but his campaign helped fuel the public's concern over communism, a fear that came to be called the Red Scare. Truman grew tired of the accusations, as well as other political battles. He decided not to seek re-election in 1952. Instead, he retired with his wife, to their home in Missouri. At first, many Americans had mixed emotions about Truman's presidency. For the most part, they did not support the Korean War and they remained suspicious that his government had included communist supporters. But Truman's public reputation rose over time. He became known as a down-to-earth person who would and could fight if needed. His supporters liked to say, Give him hell, Harry. Truman is also remembered for taking some steps toward ensuring equal rights for all Americans. Truman supported the racial desegregation of the military and banned racial discrimination in the civil service. But Truman is probably best remembered for the difficult decisions he made during his presidency, especially the one to drop atomic bombs on Japan. To the end of his life, he accepted responsibility for the decision and did not apologize for it. Truman died of natural causes at the age of 88. His remains are buried at his presidential library in Independence, Missouri. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly.
that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 